you want to grow personally and in your practice. You're working your buns off, but it feels like you've hit a block. You're not sure how much harder you can work and ask yourself, shouldn't it be easier? Yes, it should be easier and it can be easier. In today's episode, you will find out what you need to do to put your growth on the fast track. Hello, my friend. How are you doing today? It's been a while since I've given you a little snapshot of what's been going on with me. So I thought I would start here with a little snapshot. I am still moving to Sedona. It's still happening. I've been putting things in place to help me get squared away here in Northern California that need to happen before the move. And I'm really excited about it. But at the same time, I know it's going to be a culture shock. I'm really used to living in big cities like Los Angeles, San Diego. I even spent a year in Cairo, Egypt during college. And I never saw myself moving to a city that had a population of 10,000 people. It's kind of mind blowing when I step back and think about it like that. But I also know I'm going to love it. And it's really important for my vision of my life and how I want to move forward in it. I've been putting the finishing touches on my precision planning for law firm growth program that's coming out soon. And I have some really fun additions I've been thinking about that are really going to zhuzh it up, that are really going to add some excitement to it and also help you get the results that you want to grow your practice and really feel calm and secure in your problem solving abilities so you can move forward with a really clear vision about how you want to move forward in the next 12 months in your practice. And just the other day, I sent out a few emails to my VIP email list to offer spots in another program I'm running for a limited time. And I brought together more lawyers who want to work on their practices with me in that container. It's a bonus for all my one-on-one clients who get everything that I do, including Uh, one-on-one access to me outside of our coaching call, but I thought I'd invite heart-centered lawyers who were highly motivated to work on improving the long-term sustainability of their law practice into this program with me for six months. And if you're not on my VIP email list, you wouldn't have heard about this offer because it was something I only offered my VIPers. So if you want to make sure that you don't miss out on new opportunities I offer, I highly suggest getting on my email list. And if you go to the show notes, I've included a few different resources for you that you can sign up for and get on that email list. And the next time I put together something new, you'll be the first to know about it. You can download any of these resources in the show notes at dinacataldo.com forward slash 303. All right, so let's talk about the nine must do actions that will fast track your growth. This episode is really for any lawyer who wants to improve, whether it's personally, whether it is promoting within their firm, whether it is growing their long pra- their law practice and making it a long-term sustainable proposition for themselves. But while I've put these in numerical order, their order is not important. What is important is that you really pay attention to where your gaps are and where you want to place your attention on in the future. I would just pick one. And if I were to focus on any of them, it would be either number one through four or number nine, right? All of them ideally, right? But you got to start somewhere. So just pick one. For me, numbers one through four and number nine were the keys for me. They were the keys for me to build the emotional courage that I needed in order to do the other actions on this list. For me to do things like leave my law practice, to start a business, to grow my business, to do things that felt scary. So I want you to know that all of these must-do actions are things you can do. You can do them. You do not have to do all of them at once. They build upon each other. It's a cumulative effect. So don't feel like you have to like perfect your way into becoming the person that you want. That never works. In fact, we have to accept where we are now and simply look at where's one thing, one area of our lives we can improve. So that's what I want to do for you here, to, you here today with this episode. I don't want you to go into it thinking you've got to be perfect, that you've got to do all of these things right now. No, I want you to just pick one and then work on that. All right, so let's dig in. Number one, 
prioritizing mental well-being. This was item number one on my agenda when I realized I was burned out. It can look a lot of different ways prioritizing your mental well-being, but it's got to become a non-negotiable. And one of the things I talk about in precision planning for law firm growth is the fact that you've got to have these non-negotiables if you are planning on growing a business. If you do not have these non-negotiables built in, baked in to your plan, you will burn out. And that is where I was when I was learning this lesson. So it could look like a lot of different things. It could be yoga, running, eating healthy, meditation, playing the guitar, going for walks. It could be coaching. I have a client who I was talking to recently, and uh, we had had a conversation about somatic breathing exercises, and I told her the benefits I received from those. She started doing somatic breathing exercises, and now that's one of her non-negotiables. She loves it. It helps her regulate her nervous system. It works in conjunction with the coaching that we're doing. So find something you love. Make space for it in your life. It could be finger painting, right? If you just make 20 minutes a week, start there, start somewhere doing something that you love. It will start to give you some emotional balance to the work that you're doing. I know you might be struggling right now. You might be feeling totally overwhelmed with your work. I've been there. And the thing that really helped me through it was yoga. It was something I resisted for a long time. So if you notice yourself thinking about doing something new like yoga or art or playing an instrument or something like that, and, and it's been on your mind and you keep resisting it, that is your soul. I don't know how else to say it. It's, the, it's that deeper, higher essence of you knocking on your door telling you, hey, Pay attention to me. Give me what I need. Like, listen to that voice. Listen to that voice and allow that. Make time for it because it will change everything for you. When you start really allowing yourself to ask for what you need and give it to yourself, things start shifting. You begin stepping into a different version of you. I see it time and again with my clients. They start giving themselves what they need. They start telling themselves that what I want matters and they prioritize themselves. And at first they feel guilty. They feel like, oh, I shouldn't be giving myself so much time. I shouldn't be giving myself any time. But once they knock that domino over, they start to expand. And not only do they take care of themselves, but they then step into this version of themselves that realizes, oh, I've been saying yes to all these things that I didn't want to say yes to. I've been resenting all of the activities I've been doing that I've been saying yes to. And there's a lot of things that I have been saying no to that I want to say yes to, but I couldn't because I didn't know how. So I want you to really consider if this is something that is not in your life, that this is your first step. You creating some emotional balance by prioritizing your emotional well-being. Just find something and do it. All right. The second must-do action item is this, making space to think. We cannot create a vision for what we want until we create space to simply think, to simply B. Until we decide what we want, we run around chasing what we think other people want from us, right? Oh, well, we need to do more client work because they're chasing us to do client work. Oh, I have to respond to this email. I have to do this. I have to do that. And I know right now you may feel overwhelmed with client demands, but if you don't make time to think, to create a vision and to strategize what must be done to align yourself with your vision of what you want and who you want to be in the world, you will always feel overwhelmed. That's one of the reasons my clients see results so fast is because they devote 50 minutes every single week to help themselves and their practice, to make those shifts. We use that time to clear their minds and tap into what they rarely give themselves an opportunity to tap into their inner knowing, their higher self, that version of them that's knocking at the door saying, hey, let me in. We want to go this direction. It's going to be amazing. Trust me. Let go of all those fears. Their ability to problem solve any situation really benefits them when they can get there, when they can quiet their mind and then follow that quiet voice inside of them telling them, ah, yes, I want that. But until you make that time for yourself, you cannot make change. 
And I've worked with lawyers who, you know, have told me I, I, but I multitask. I like doing all this stuff. I like having all this sound on while I'm working. And those things may in the moment feel comfortable, but if you don't allow yourself to be quiet with all the noise in the world, because I understand we've got the news, we've got, you know, all these news programs on the radio, you know, if you're listening to, you know, NPR or whatever programs you listen to, we've got podcasts with a million people's opinions. We've got, including this one, right? I've got some strong opinions. So if we allow all of those voices in and we don't let our voice in, we cannot problem solve. We cannot even decide what we want. We cannot even create a vision. And we're going to talk more about creating a vision in a little bit. But I want you to consider that if you are not creating quiet time for yourself, you're unable to tap into that higher knowing, you are unable to really problem solve for yourself and ask yourself what you need and what you want, and then move in that direction and create action in alignment with that version of you. The third action item for you is to be kinder to yourself. It doesn't require perfection either. When I have days I'm quote unquote off, right? I don't beat myself up for not getting more done, right? I acknowledge that I'm having a tough day and that's okay. It happens. We're human. What needs to get done will get done. And if I can't do it today, that's okay. I will figure it out. When I don't do everything I've placed on my calendar, I'm not hard on myself. I recognize that either I wasn't as focused as I wanted to be that day, or there was something that needed to be taken care of that was a priority. And that needed to be taken care of right now. And then I just reassign the old task. I try not to reassign frequently, but it does happen and that's okay. Having or doing my calendar perfectly, quote, quote unquote, doesn't mean anything about me. Just like it doesn't mean anything about me if I do do it, don't do it perfectly, right? Is I'm not a bad person if I don't do something on my calendar. I'm not a bad person if I skip the gym, you know, whatever it is. But we need to learn the difference between being kind to ourselves, right, and beating ourselves up for not doing something. And one of the things I hear from lawyers is that it, they're afraid that if they don't do something on their calendar, that they're letting themselves off the hook. But what is the hook? You're creating the hook. So it's so fascinating. If you hear yourself saying these words, why do you think you're letting yourself off the hook? Do you think that if you don't do it today, that you're a bad person somehow? That somehow if you don't reach those levels of perfection that you expect of yourself, that you're letting yourself down, that you're letting others down, that you're not successful, that you're not going to be the person you want to be in this world? I will tell you, as big of a proponent I am of managing your time and doing it in a way that makes sense efficiently and effectively, creating systems, all of that, if you are beating yourself up along the way, none of it matters. Because the most important thing in this world is compassion, not just compassion for others, but compassion for ourselves. And if we're expecting perfection from ourselves, we are not being compassionate to ourselves. And I can say this as a person who for years beat the crap out of myself and shamed myself for not doing all of the things that I thought I should be doing. Anytime you find yourself telling yourself, I should be doing more, I should be doing this, I should be doing that, that is a subtle way of beating yourself up. So if you notice these things, know that this is just one of the action items to do is to say, oh, I notice that I'm beating myself up. Because once you start noticing you're beating yourself up, you might beat yourself up for beating yourself up. You might say, oh, I shouldn't be doing that. Why am I beating myself up? But instead, what I want to offer to you is to say, hey, you're having a hard day today. I get it. It's okay. What do you need? Right? This is all working hand in hand. When you're kind to yourself, you're also promoting your emotional well-being. Right, You are really listening to that version of you who needs something, and then you can give it to yourself. So ask yourself what you need and then give it to yourself. If at four o'clock or three o'clock in the afternoon, you're pooped and you're looking at your calendar and you're wondering, how do I have the brain cells to get through the rest of the day? It's okay to say, okay, let's make a decision. 
am I going to sit here for two hours and I'm going to ruminate about these two items on my calendar and tell myself I'm a horrible person if I don't do them? Or am I going to say three o'clock is my end day for today and I'm going to take those two items I have and I'm going to put them on tomorrow or I'm going to put them on next week or I'm going to delete them off my calendar completely. Those are the kinds of decisions we get to make for ourselves when we start being compassionate to ourselves instead of beating ourselves up. We start to actually see, oh, is this something I really want to do or am I killing myself to do it? Am I burning myself out so I can get this done? So just start looking for those things. All right, action item number four, create a vision. We're actually gonna do more work on this in the podcast, but I want to talk to you about vision because so few of us really sit down and think of a vision for ourselves, looking one year out, looking three years out, looking ahead in a way that gives us a fuller idea of what we truly want. And I was talking to a client about this and she noticed that she was feeling some pushback because she didn't want to create a vision in some sense because she was afraid that it wouldn't align with what her husband would want, which makes a lot of sense. We don't want to do anything that is maybe going to separate us from somebody else. But we want to tap into our vision with with what we want, totally what we want. And that allows us to step into a conversation with our partner around what our vision is and talk about these things. If we don't even know what we want, we cannot stand up and say, hey, I want this. What do you want? What do you think about this? Right? And then start having a conversation. And if the other person doesn't want what you want, that's okay. You don't need to want the same things. You do not need to be on the exact same path. You're different human beings. It would make sense that we would be on different paths, right? But you also get to have the conversation to say, well, I get to have what I want and you get to have what you want. It's not an either or proposition. You just maybe the timing isn't exactly what each of you would like, but you figure it out. But you can't even move forward until you know what you want and can have that conversation. Having a vision really focuses our mind. It focuses our actions. It prevents us from wasting time doing things that we don't even really want, doing things that we've been telling ourselves for years that we should want, that should be the right things for us. I saw this with myself when I was in my legal career. I stayed in that job for a really long time thinking this is what I should want. What a great job. Like it has everything. Like why should I want more? But I had this deep desire for something more. Meanwhile, the people around me, and we're going to talk about this in number nine, the people around me didn't see anything that needed to change. And I didn't feel that way. I I desired more. So I couldn't make decisions based on where the company was going or the, the agency was going. I needed to make decisions based on what I wanted. So I want you to just recognize that a vision is really something that helps give you direction, right? So if you sit down and you can really get a vision for yourself, what do you want? What do you want your life to be like day to day? Where do you want to live? Where do you want your practice to be? How do you want your practice designed? How many hours are you spending in the office? Are you leading a team? Are you working in your business? Are you a manager or are you a CEO? Like if you really start thinking about how you want to be in your practice, then you get to see all the places in your practice where you can make shifts to help you get there. It will show you, and we're going to talk more about this in precision planning for law firm growth. It shows you where you need to have systems, where there are gaps in your knowledge so that you are able to take yourself to the level that you want to go. It can be scary. It can be scary. I know for me, when I look at the vision that I have for my business, I, sometimes I think, oh, wow, is that really? Is that, I could I can do that? And it may not be on my timeline. Maybe it doesn't happen in three years. Maybe it happens in five years, but there's no harm if you're kind to yourself, right? This is key. You've got to be kind to yourself. If you don't hit your goal in the three-year mark, you've got to just be okay with it and recognize, ah, yes, okay, I see. I see where my gaps are. I see where I can take different action and I'm going to keep moving forward. But you can't even do that if you don't have the skills to speak kindly to yourself and make those evaluations. We're going to talk about all of that in precision planning. 
Okay. The fifth must do action item to fast track your growth is this. Pay attention to your finances. Inside precision planning, I'm including a module on this as well as money mindset, because it's important that we look at what's happening in our finances, whether it's business or it's personal. And I was talking to a client who went through this training that I gave her, and she didn't realize how she could measure or use the profit that she was accumulating within her practice. And she didn't really realize how much salary she should be giving herself if she wanted to hit these other monetary goals. But once we start getting awareness around our finances, even when they feel scary to look at, it helps us feel more in control of our futures. It helps us see what other actions we need to take to be in alignment with our vision of the life and the practice that we want to have. And that requires us doing some uncomfortable things sometimes. It requires us to look at the numbers. And a lot of times I'll hear lawyers say, I became a lawyer, so I didn't have to look at the numbers, but you can't abdicate authority over your numbers. You've got to take a look at your numbers. Otherwise, you're going to be unfocused. You're not going to have the strategy that you need in order to change the direction of your practice because you want to steer your practice in the direction you want to go, your life in the direction that you want to go, but you can't do that if you don't have the data. The sixth must-do action item is this, create systems and begin tweaking them. I did a whole episode on this, and I will link to it in the show notes. I'm also including time management under this one because using a calendar is a system. Think of systems as a living, breathing consciousness. You can create it once, but it will need to be honed trained, refined, and that takes patience and attention. We tend not to have patience with ourselves or give ourselves much attention. So this can feel challenging until we've done the prior action items that I've talked about in this episode. One of my clients, for instance, started creating systems and they started having a cumulative effect, right? She started recognizing, she had laid the foundation we've talked about here, but she started recognizing that When she created systems, it was actually opening doors for her to to take peeks into her practice where she could make improvements. And the more she did these systems, the more she recognized where she could tweak them, where she could evolve them, where she was not only making her life easier with these systems. Because we tend to think that systems are for our benefit and that they're really going to make our lives better. And yes, they do. But What we don't tend to think about is that when we start doing the work of creating systems, we're actually able to create better experiences for our clients who work with us. And whenever you improve your client's experience of working with you, you increase the value of your services. Systems give you an insight into your practice that you simply can't have until you begin the step-by-step process of creating them and then put them into practice. So if you're curious about the, the specifics of this particular instance, What my client noticed in her estate planning practice is that when a decedent's family came in, they had the same questions over and over again. And a lot of times, you know, you have family member who's passed, you go into a lawyer's office, you are grieving, right? You're grieving. You're kind of all over the place. You're not quite yourself. You're unfocused. You don't really know what you don't know. Like you just, you're going in kind of blind. And she realized that she could actually look at these questions, help come up with the answers with her initial interviews with the client, right? Now the decedent, but at the time when they were living, they were her client. So then that way she could head off all of these problems that decedents were having or decedents families were having when they came in. So not only could she bring these issues to her client's attention, but it made the lives of their family members so much easier when they were already dealing with so much emotion. They didn't have to deal with all of the other things that come up, like where's the will? Where's the key to the property? Where do I get this? What's this? I don't know how to do this. They didn't tell me how to do this. Where's this document? She could then head all of that off early on in her work with her initial client. So this is the power of sitting down and thinking through systems. But again, you can't even get to systems if you don't have the other's in place. So if you're not sitting down 
creating some quiet space, creating a vision for your practice. You cannot even sit down to do systems. So we're going to talk about creating that space and give you that space and precision planning so that you can start thinking through the systems that you need in order to better not only your client's experience, but really change the impact that your practice can have on not only your client, but maybe their whole family. Number seven, expand your contacts and reach out to them for help. All right. This is something I'm committed to doing more of right now. And it's something I haven't always been great at doing. I did an episode called Adventures in Networking, and I will link to that in the show notes where I talk about this more in depth. What I'm doing right now is reevaluating my vision and seeing how I can grow my contacts, reach out to more of them, and consequently help more people. So for example, if you want to begin doing more speaking engagements, consider reaching out to contacts to ask them if they know people in specific areas who are doing events or if they know event planners that are doing particular events that you're looking to get involved in. You can start with your closest contacts to make this really easy, right? The ones you see regularly at local events or ones that you're really close friends with. And then you can expand that list as you go. Expanding our reach outside of our small world, right? It expands our impact. It expands who we're able to help. And it is not always super comfortable, especially if you're like me and you were you were raised to think, nope, you need to be independent. You shouldn't be asking for help. You should really be just know how to do this on your own. And, and it really kept me from asking for help for a really long time. And it's not going to be comfortable if you come from that background and that's okay. Growth almost never is comfortable. And this brings me to action item number eight, allowing discomfort instead of fighting it. When we do new things or get outside our comfort zone, we will feel uncomfortable. We'll know we're uncomfortable if we observe what we're not doing in our business that we know would expand our impact and or increase our profitability. This is where having a calendar system is so helpful because when we observe ourselves not putting something on the calendar, like having a money meeting with ourselves or putting things on our calendar and then repeatedly not doing those things, that shows us where our edge is. In yoga, the edge is that place you take yourself in your practice where you feel shaky and unsure of yourself. The practice in yoga is to keep taking yourself to your edge over and over again, even when you're uncomfortable, even if it's in baby steps, even when you're falling over or you feel resistance coming up and you t- you notice yourself telling yourself, oh man, I got to do that, right? Notice it. That's where the growth comes. And that's when we can expand what we can do in our practice. The same thing goes for feeling uncomfortable in our business. We need to get closer and closer to our edge to expand. So for example, if your edge is telling people your rates or telling people your rates without discounting them in a consult, you are going to feel uncomfortable telling your rates and not discounting. You may not even want to say your rates out loud. And what happens is, is later on, it makes it really awkward in conversations with clients when it comes to asking them to pay if you haven't talked about price. But let's talk about discounting without the potential client even asking for a discount, right? That happens too. So those are edges. Those are edges where you find yourself doing these things without sitting in the discomfort of not doing those things. So your edge would be, for instance, sitting in a consult, planning ahead of time to say your price out loud, saying out out loud, and then sitting with the discomfort of being quiet while your potential client thinks and breathing. And then you don't discount. That is the edge. And when you practice that, when you feel that discomfort in your body and you don't react to it, that is growth. And it is messy and it's imperfect. And some days you will blurt out a discount. Some days you will not want to say the price. But when you sit with the discomfort, you will notice the growth. You will be so proud of yourself because you saw it and you stuck with it. I see it time and time again with my clients who do these things, and then they're so proud of themselves when they really just sit and they allow the discomfort. And that brings me to action item number nine, put yourself around people who 
who elevate you. Not everyone understands when we're trying to grow and evolve ourselves and our businesses. It takes a special kind of person to want to see our flaws, right? We're looking for our flaws and we want to work on those flaws to better ourselves. So I commend you for being one of those people. You wouldn't be here listening to this podcast if you weren't one of those people. Being around people who don't understand us It can sometimes be disheartening because they might say things that aren't as supportive or as understanding as we would like. And if we're not able to communicate what we need, this can feel horrible, right? One of the things that really helped me in my growth was surrounding myself with people who were like-minded, who were going after personal growth, who wanted to grow businesses. And I really started to feel supported. I really felt like I wasn't alone. And I think about my business as a tool to evolve myself, right? It's it's not just something to make money and to keep a roof over my head and all of that, right? It's It's my chance to evolve myself. And the thing that evolves us, I believe the most, is being able to expand our ability to serve more people in doing something that we really love. It's got to be something like a, a want match, right? When, where we're giving something that we love and in return, they're giving us something that we need, right? It's something that is, it's magical when you really think about it, like being able to participate in the society that we participate in and get to evolve ourselves and grow ourselves using a business. I just I just think it's amazing. So I look at the business to as a tool to expand my current capacity to serve more people. And I'm always trying to challenge myself and my vision to expand. This requires that I surround myself with people and coaches who get me, who can challenge me. And I encourage you to look around, connect with people you see who are the same or similar And they are on a path where they want to expand too. And there's somebody that you can kind of either look at what they're doing and kind of emulate it, or at least you can have conversations with them and they understand you and where you're coming from. I think it's so important that we don't feel alone on this path, that we have people that we can connect with. And that could be somebody that you find at, you know, a local meeting. It could be a coach. It could be listening to a podcast where you, you're hearing things that they really resonate with you and they inspire you to take action. And so I hope that this podcast can be that for you. If that's what you're looking for right now, I want to support you and challenge you to help you fast track your growth. And if this episode really spoke to you and you want personalized help, To help you achieve your goals, I encourage you to book a strategy session with me. We will talk, and if we both believe that we're a good fit to work together, we'll go from there. And you can book a strategy session with me at dinacataldo.com forward slash strategy session. All right, my friend, I hope you have a beautiful rest of your week. And as always, what you want matters, and it is within your power to make it happen.